upside down in terms of why they're regulating. We now have too much rather than too little. And if we now have too much rather than too little, and it really doesn't matter which way it comes into us, it's still coming through a singular device because we have set standards that all of the inputs have to come the same way. That's the logic for regulating them all. Yeah, I mean, is that the set top box? That's the set top box proceeding, absolutely. Yeah. If you standardize everything and you say, look, there's no distinction between the reception of, of the internet, and by the way, the other <laughs> issue that, that we can talk about later is you keep using the term internet. What the heck is the internet? It's this cloud that people keep describing, right? But they want to regulate the deliverers of the internet. Well, but I'm not the one that originates the speech if I'm the deliverer. So who exactly? That goes to your Kindle issue. But it also goes to the Title II issue, saying that if you're just the deliverer, why aren't you treated just like a common carrier? Why but are they really saying that you're only going to regulate the deliverer or are they saying, I mean, if the DMCA is correct and the deliverer does not have the responsibility for the obscene statement, let's say, uh, and now we're going to regulate the obligation of speakers to make sure that children are protected because there's too much sugar in the cereal, does that now apply to all speakers? Because it's no longer the deliverer that we're talking about. It is the originator of the comment that we're talking about. So now we've got advertising. We've, we've got every, everybody who speaks has suddenly been regulated. Well, I think there was a question that the lecture wasn't long enough for you. That I, I, you were just warming up as far as I was concerned. We got a lot of problems here. Are there any questions? <laughs> You touched on this briefly, but um, it's a question concerning the um, request that the FCC reclassify the provision of internet service as a common carrier service, at yeah. least internet access service, sort of cleaving that off from the rest of the cloud internet image. Um, would that be, could that conceivably constitute a infringement of First Amendment protections sure. because today they are speakers. Sure. I mean, and, and that's it's the very question that was presented in the telco cases uh, prior to the passage of the 96 Act. Uh, can you force someone to be a common carrier, particularly where they have evolved into something beyond that? What they're trying to do is cram network providers into a 19th century model that the telegraph was based on. Um, and, and telephone service where all you were doing was delivering the call to grandma, and of course, the carrier played no role in the content of that transmission. But of course, today, where you've got uh, you know, multimedia and a myriad of programming sources and involvement of the network provider, in, depending on who you're talking about, in a variety of ways in that, that enterprise, uh, then you really can't conceptualize them back in that sort of siloed world in which you're providing just that. So to do that, I think, by to, to simply say we've changed the regulatory classifications can't be done without a constitutional input. Yeah. So Bob, I want to ask you to do something you rarely do, which is give the, the regulators a little credit here, which is that we haven't seen the FCC as of late endorse any of the worst case scenarios that you and I that keep you and I up at night. Yeah. And in fact, you know, direct regulation seems to be dying out, maybe because we've made the normative case so powerfully, or maybe because they realize, practically speaking, direct, direct regulation just is not going to work in an age of YouTube and Twitter and everything else. Maybe the, the smarter group there at the FCC now realizes that. But what they seem to be doing is this sort of what you call the regulation by intimidation or sort of this uh, indirect form of censorship by subtly uh, encouraging them, uh, you know, content companies certain way or media intermediaries do things a certain way. We've talked about the debate, debate for example, over default settings in where um, private parental control may be set or whether private parental control should just be on board uh, of certain devices. Yeah. Um, and then other questions about what online intermediaries should do in terms of should there be safe search settings and you know, how should they be established. I mean, constitutionally speaking, how far can a regulator go before they cross a line uh, in First Amendment terms, by doing those sorts of indirect uh, forms of intimidation. 
notice that in this presentation, there are no quotes from Chairman Janikowski. You kind of have to go back to where you have this sort of unvarnished uh, sort of land grab for more regulatory authority uh, back in the Henry Hunt days, where he was really quite direct about it and what he wanted to do, what his intentions were, and his desire to use the regulatory approval process to win concessions. I, I always thought it was just remarkable about how open that was being done. Now it's a little bit more in the shadow, um, which I don't think is necessarily a good thing. Um, but you know, it, it conceivably could at some point um, raise the, the question of whether or not the FCC had gone too far in trying to create some sort of informal deal. Now the problem with that, of course, is that the person who makes the deal isn't going to bring a challenge. Because obviously, from a regulatory standpoint, if someone has gotten a regulatory approval or something else that they need from the, uh, the FCC to operate, uh, they are unlikely to then turn around and point their finger and say that you forced me to do this. Uh, and so, it's hard to find a fact pattern that will lead to an effective FCC challenge. But it's not to say that you know the courts might not be a little bit frustrated if it's presented in the right situation, as they were back. Here too, it's not just a matter of the regulators uh, imposing regulation. Although you do appropriately quote some regulators who were moved to, to sort of lead in that direction. Um, but um, you know, for example, uh, you go back in the, these cable cases in the '80s, and uh, the line you put preferred communications versus City of Los Angeles. Yeah. There, I was the expert <laughs> witness, the economic expert for the plaintiff, and uh, they, they won that in the Supreme Court, nine to nothing, completely on the. <laughs> or, or, or so I believe. Anyway, um, you know that 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 was a case that came out of the uh, Ninth Circuit that really took a hardline position that cable was a First Amendment protected medium. Yeah. And you could no more give out a monopoly franchise for cable TV than you could do it for a newspaper. And that was very strongly worded when the attorneys uh, for the plaintiff finished with the oral arguments. They said, "We're going to win this one eight to one." Rehnquist is the only dissenter. Rehnquist ended up writing a nine to, nine to nothing opinion <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and uh, circled back to water it down. But they had very, they, I mean, they had gone a long way with that argument. Well, preferred they, they, was really, it was really the beginning. I mean, you had a little bit like in the Midwest video case, but preferred was the first time you really had, you had some lower court decisions like, like the preferred uh, uh, case itself and the decision in Santa Cruz and so on. Um, yeah. uh, Palo Alto was a great uh, Palo, Oh yeah, Palo Alto was, was a terrific one. We were working on the Erie case at the time. And, uh, you know, the preferred case was the first time you really saw the, the Supreme Court kind of open the door and say, we want to hear more about these arguments. We yeah. want to hear more about cable as a traditional medium subject to traditional First Amendment protections. Yeah. But what happens, what I'm going to say is that what, what happens is that that peters out. In fact, even in the preferred case, the uh, when, when it finally it was sent down, they won on summary judgment in the district court, and then they uh, got that upheld in the circuit on the second time around, but there was no, there was no remedy. There was no uh, franchise, no, no injunction against the city. There were, there were no attorney's fees. They, they'd won seven, seven counts of violation of their, their uh, civil rights, and they had no remedy whatever. They could go back to the city of Los Angeles and say, okay, let's start this up 14 years later. Yeah. Uh, and LA said, with a big smile, we'll be happy to do it, do it better this time. So there's no sanction again. Anyway, yeah. what happens after the 86, uh, Supreme Court ruling really, that the cable industry had been very pro First Amendment, but they, but but the industry then then bailed on the First Amendment. They started referencing the uh, the people pushing that uh, litigation as First Amendment purists, the renegades. Yeah. Well, yeah. fundamentalists and purists. When when, when people in Washington use the term purist, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know they're not yeah. complimenting well, you. As if they did that. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. I, 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 you haven't even. We, I haven't even begun to offend you yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so
<laughs> exactly. So, so, so the point, the point is that cable cuddles up uh, to the to the franchising process at that point. They really they really have a you know a turnaround on, on what's going to go um, in, in their direction on this. They start pushing state franchising laws uh, that are very regulatory. Started in 1987 in the state of Florida. So this is right after preferred and. Uh, National Cable TV Association, um, you know, is basically in quote unquote in the middle now. They're 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 no longer First Amendment purists. The, the, the cable industry is not looking at the franchise as as a newspaper franchise anymore. It's it's something different. It's for cable, and in fact, that compromise reigns today. Went went right through went right through uh, Turner both both Turner cases. Cable's in the middle. So there's 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 no extreme. You know, newspaper is cable. Cable is a newspaper. First Amendment. And that's very close to what the cable industry position has been. So I, you know, I, I, I think that the rent-seeking opportunities obviously are legion here, and uh, the strategies of, of, you know, when we look at net neutrality or, or the cable First Amendment thing, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of instances where the industry is, is really the, the formative factor in, in pushing a coalition to adopt regulatory interventions, and, and we have to be very wary of that. Looking at the number of baffled looks in the face, you're hearing the exchange between these two reminds me of the old joke about the comics who go to the delicatessen, and they've all heard all the jokes, and so they just use, they just refer to the joke by number. Number 32! And some of the next table falls on the lap, and no one else knows anything about what's going on. But yeah, this is talking about sort of ancient history in uh, litigation over um, the First Amendment uh, status of, of cable television. But yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, different industries will have different positions at different times. It's like Napoleon Bonaparte said, a man won't hide fight harder for his interests than he will for his rights. Uh, but that being said, I mean, I think uh, the trend of deregulation over the past three decades has been so beneficial uh, that uh, you know, I think there has been a more of an interest in promoting um, protections that are based on recognizing <coughs> human rights. Um, and you know, I, I still see that as the, the prevailing trend. Take a look at what the industry did with Muscarelle and the Turner cases. What the Supreme Court basically said to us was, you argued it on the wrong issue. You shouldn't have argued it on the First Amendment. You should have argued it on the Fifth. As a taking, you could argue. On a First Amendment basis, we're going to look at the economic argument and say, well, you could stop somebody else from speech, and therefore, Muscarelle is OK. So the industry was basically told, you try to go down a purist path of First Amendment, you're going to lose. And, and we are now finally, it's, it's taken 